on World News Tonight. Neighbours' decision. Both China and Pakistan decide to boycott the G20 summit hosted by India. What is the reason for this sudden decision? Find out tonight. Border Squadron. Russia creates a new counter-terrorism squadron to eradicate newly formed anti-Putin group. Rejected again. The World Health Assembly rejects Taiwan-related proposal again, pointing to more organizations leaning towards China. Lego Royalty The coronation of King Charles III gets a bricky turn as the whole event is recreated in Lego in Windsor. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening to all our viewers and thank you for watching World News Tonight. Now, neighboring India is preparing for the G20 summit and has defended its decision to host the meeting in the Himalayan territory of Jammu and Kashmir, despite criticism from rights groups and expected boycotts from a handful of countries. Srinagar, the summer capital of Jammu and Kashmir, is scheduled to host a tourism meeting for G20 members this week in a move that the Indian government has marketed as an opportunity to showcase the region's culture. It is the first international event of this scale to be held in the disputed Muslim-majority region since India revoked its special status and split the former state into two federal territories in 2019. Tensions along the de facto border have been simmering for more than 60 years and have spilled over into war before. Other countries, including Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Turkey, were expected to boycott the event. On the other hand, hundreds of people rallied in Pakistan-administered Kashmir to protest arch rival India's decision to host a G20 tourism meeting in its part of the disputed Himalayan region. Several protesters demonstrated in Muzaffarabad, capital of Pakistan-administered Kashmir. Pakistan, which is not a G20 member, criticized India's decision to hold the tourism meeting in Kashmir, calling it an irresponsible move. Nuclear armed nations, Pakistan and India have fought three wars since independence from Britain in 1947, two of them over Kashmir, which they each claim in full but control parts of. Despite the boycott, India, the world's largest democracy with a population of more than 1.4 billion, has been keen to position itself as a leader of emerging and developing nations since it assumed the G20 presidency. Over the weekend at the G7 summit, U.S. President Joe Biden invited his Korean and Japanese counterparts to Washington. The talks may take place as early as this summer for the expansion of cooperation, especially of the fields of security. Three-way talks between the leaders of South Korea, the United States and Japan could take place in Washington, D.C. as early as this summer. That's according to a report by Yonam News Agency quoting an unnamed official at South Korea's presidential office on Monday. South Korea's Vice Minister of Defense Shin bum Chul during his radio appearance also on Monday said that while he has yet to hear specifics, the talks could possibly take place in the summer or in September before the United Nations General Assembly. The trilateral meeting, according to reports, was suggested by U.S. President Joe Biden during a meeting with President Yoon Sung yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Sunday on the sidelines of the G7. Reportedly, a specific timeline will be finalized after consideration of the three nations' political and diplomatic schedules. It's expected that the trilateral talks will involve a discussion of measures to, quote, upgrade trilateral cooperation to a new level as shared by Yoon's office Sunday. The presidential office spokesperson Lee Doon said in a written briefing Sunday that the leaders of the three countries agreed to deepen trilateral cooperation in security, such as real-time sharing of information on North Korean missile warnings. He said there would be cooperative efforts in other areas too, such as economic security and Indo-Pacific strategies. But it's expected that the expansion of cooperation would first come in security. An agreement could possibly be made during the meeting of the three countries' defense ministers at the Shangri-La Dialogue, or Asia's premier defense summit in June. If so, the real-time sharing of warning information could begin in the second half of the year. Regarding this, South Korea's defense ministry spokesperson Chun ha said that negotiations for specific implementation plans are underway. The South Korean team of experts will dive into an official on-site inspection of the Fukushima waste water. The team will inspect radioactive water storage tanks and the purification process at the Fukushima plant. 
A team of 21 South Korean experts on Tuesday will visit the Fukushima nuclear power plant to begin the inspection of water stored at the site. This comes amid lingering concerns about the safety of the wastewater from the crippled plant ahead of its plant release into the sea. The inspection team will be at the site for two days, with day one focusing on examining the so-called Alps purification system that removes radioactive substances from the contaminated water before it's released into the ocean. On Wednesday, the team will visit a chemistry research lab at the plant to assess the facilities and the processes used to determine radionuclides in the wastewater. Ahead of the inspection, the team held a meeting on Monday with officials from the Tokyo Electric Power Company, which runs the Fukushima Power Plant, and officials from Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, as well as members of the Nuclear Regulation Authority. During the meeting, the South Korean team reaffirmed the list of facilities requiring inspection. It also requested inspection records of each facility and data on the contaminated water before and after filtration through the ALPS system. After completing the two-day on-site inspection in Fukushima, the team is scheduled to hold a more in-depth meeting with Japanese officials in Tokyo on the last day, May 25th, ahead of their return. Over to the war in Ukraine, an anti-terrorist operation has been launched in a border city in Russia after a group of anti-Putin Russian nationals launched an attack inside Belgorod. A group of anti-Putin Russian nationals has claimed responsibility for an attack in Russia's southwestern city of Belgorod, prompting the region's governor to launch an anti-terrorist operation to hunt down those responsible for the attack. The current situation is that eight people were injured. According to information from the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Defense, there were no civilian casualties. Once again, the situation is tense and remains so. A counter-terrorist operation was declared. Many restrictions are in place. The Russian governor added that a large part of the local population had evacuated the area. Moscow has placed the blame on Ukraine, claiming that the group of Russian nationals has aligned itself with the Ukrainian army. However, while Ukraine does acknowledge that Russian citizens in two separate paramilitary groups had carried out an operation in the area, it acted independently and without any orders from Kyiv. The groups, who call themselves the Freedom of Russia Legion and the Russian Volunteer Corps, said in a Telegram post that they had liberated a settlement in the Belgorod region. Russian authorities are still searching for those responsible for the attack, which led to eight people being injured after a village was shelled. Fighting also damaged three houses and a local administrative building. The event in Belgorod marks the first time that Ukrainian-aligned forces have launched a cross-border land operation against Russian targets. The World Health Assembly, the highest decision-making body of the World Health Organization, decided not to include in its agenda a proposal made by a few countries on Taiwan's participation in the annual assembly as an observer. Chen Zhu, China's permanent representative to the United Nations office at Geneva, lauded the move, saying that it shows the international community's support for the One China principle. Currently, global health security poses significant challenges and most assembly member states hope for increased solidarity and cooperation to tackle these issues. Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party has gone against the trend and insisted on Taiwan-related proposals. A political ploy to engage in Taiwan independence separate his activities by hyping up its participation in the WHA. The DPP refuses to recognize that both sides of the Taiwan Strait belonging to one China, unilaterally abandoning the political foundation for the Taiwan region to participate in the WHA. Shen emphasizes that before the opening of the WHA, nearly 140 countries made clear to China their position of adhering to one China principle and opposing Taiwan's participation in the WHA. Nearly 100 countries especially wrote to WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom or issued public statements on the issue. Shen said that this demonstrates that a just cause enjoys abundant support while an unjust cause finds little. The 76th WHA opened in Geneva on Sunday with a focus on saving lives, driving health for all. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. 
President Joe Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy could not reach an agreement on how to raise the U.S. government's $31.4 trillion debt ceiling with just 10 days before a possible default that could sink the U.S. economy, but bowed to keep talking. With just 10 days left until a default that could rock the American economy and beyond, there is still no deal between debt limit negotiators, headed by top congressional Republican Kevin McCarthy and President Joe Biden. Speaking to reporters on Monday, McCarthy said he would meet with the Democratic president every day until they can find a way forward on the federal government's $31.4 trillion debt ceiling and called the day's talks the best they've had. We're going to let the teams work tonight, see if we could find, get progress, but we didn't. We, productive, but not progress. Well, I would assume I'd meet with President Biden every day till we get this done. This is too important. Do you expect to meet with him tomorrow? Look, if we don't meet, I'm sure we're going to talk on the phone. But we're going to have the staff get together and then we're going to get back. It was not set that we had to see one another, or at least we're going to talk, but nothing's set. Any agreement to raise the limit must pass both chambers of Congress before Biden can sign it into law, which would take several days. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on Monday offered a sobering reminder of how little time is left, saying the earliest estimated default date remains June 1st and that it is highly likely that Treasury will no longer be able to pay all government obligations by early June if the debt ceiling is not raised. Failure to lift the debt ceiling would trigger a default that would shake financial markets and drive interest rates higher on everything from car payments to credit cards. Ongoing uncertainty is already weighing on investors and stocks. Jeff Tomasulo is CEO of Vespula Capital Management and Tactical Income. He says it's all grim deja vu. Biden is racing for a solution after insisting that Republicans should pass a clean, unconditional increase before he would agree to any spending negotiations. Under Trump, Congress raised the debt limit three times without a similar demand from Republicans for sharp spending cuts. More airstrikes and clashes have been reported in Sudan, dampening hopes for the latest attempt at a ceasefire in the conflict-hit country. But witnesses have already spoken to further hostilities in the capital Khartoum and elsewhere. Minutes after the ceasefire went into effect, witnesses reported airstrikes and clashes in what's the latest of numerous truces to have been announced and violated in five weeks of fighting. Aid groups are desperate for a passage of humanitarian aid. And the UN envoy for Sudan again urged both sides to end the violence permanently. A short-term ceasefire is not the goal. It is an instrument to go forward. Um, we will need talks about a permanent cessation of hostilities. And we will need to consider and, of course, support a new political process. At the heart of the conflict is the power struggle between the army chief, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and the RSF paramilitary group head, known as Hameti. The pair are former allies who joined forces to orchestrate the 2021 coup, until plans to integrate the RSF into the army soured relations. The conflict has displaced almost 1.1 million people internally and into neighboring countries. Meta was hit with a record $1.3 billion fine by the European Union's led privacy regulator over its handling of user information and given Meta five months to stop transferring users' data to the United States. A record fine for Meta as the tech giant was hit with a 1.2 billion euro penalty on Monday for violating the EU's data privacy laws. It's the biggest such fine since the introduction of EU GDPR laws in 2018 nearly double Amazon's 746 million euro penalty two years ago for data protection violations. Meta are accused of mishandling user data when transferring it between Europe and the US. The decision will be imposed by Ireland's Data Protection Commissioner, since Meta's European HQ is in Dublin. The Irish watchdog is giving the company five months to stop sending European user data to the US. The media firm, which owns Instagram, WhatsApp and Facebook, responded with a statement on Monday. This decision is flawed, unjustified and sets a dangerous precedent for the countless other companies transferring data between the EU and the US. There is currently no agreement covering EU-US data transfers, although Brussels and Washington signed a deal last year on a so-called privacy shield that Meta could use 
but the pact is awaiting a decision from European officials on whether it adequately protects data privacy. We expect this data protection framework between the EU and the US to be fully functional by the summer. This will guarantee stability and legal certainty, both to support these businesses and also guarantee strict protection of the private lives of citizens. Meta will also have six months to erase the data of all European users that was transferred, which some experts say could cause an even bigger headache than the fine. Wheat futures fell below $6 a bushel for the first time in more than two years as expectations of ample global supplies weighed on prices after a wartime deal to ship Ukrainian grains was extended last week. There was hope Monday for cheaper food prices ahead. Wheat futures traded in Chicago fell below $6 per bushel, the unit used, for the first time in two years. They've been dropping on bets that ample global supplies will easily meet demand. Last week also saw a deal to extend Ukraine's grain exports through the Black Sea. Russia had threatened to let the agreement expire unless there were steps to facilitate its own shipments. But in the end, the pact was extended for another two months. A commodities analyst told us that should see Ukrainian grain flowing onto world markets at a time when cheap wheat from Russia and elsewhere was already available. Exports from the EU are also expected to hit record volumes. It's shipping increasing quantities to the US. Other key agricultural commodities, including soybeans and corn, are also seeing price falls. That could spell relief for global consumers pressed by food price inflation. Last week saw Eurozone inflation accelerate to 7%, though there were signs that food price rises were easing off. At least 19 children died in a horrific school dormitory fire in Guyana, which has shocked the nation and led its president to declare three days of national mourning. The fire that engulfed Madiad Secondary School's female dormitory killed 18 girls and a boy, revising down its earlier death toll to 20. Emergency workers fought to revive a young victim airlifted to Guyana's capital, Georgetown, on Monday after a fire tore through a secondary school dormitory overnight, killing at least 19 children and injuring several others. Emergency services said the building in the central city of Madia was completely engulfed in flames by the time firefighters arrived. Captain Gerald Gavaya is Guyana's national security advisor. This is a day that will live in infamy for us because these children did not deserve to die like this. It's a day for mourning for all of us, for this country. Um, every man, woman and child and every certainly every, every parent will be, their heart will go to the parents of those children. Um, and I know today the president is going to be going to visit those parents, meet with the people, see what is it that we could do and to understand what really happened here. Gavaya said lightning, thunder and heavy rain complicated rescue efforts. But he added, the pilots were all very determined to transport the victims quickly. Some 20 students were rescued. An investigation into the cause of the fire is underway. Welcome back to World News. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Four astronauts, including two Saudis, joined seven others aboard the International Space Station after the SpaceX capsule docked with the orbiting ISS on the second all-private Axiom mission. A falling fireball was captured lighting up the night sky as it fell to Earth near Keynes Airport in Australia's Queensland state. Surveillance camera footage from the airport showed the fireball, believed to be a meteor, illuminating night sky near an open-air car park. The 19th World Meteorological Congress opened in Geneva, Switzerland. The quadrennial event assembled all the 193 member states, areas of territories of the World Meteorological Organization. Seven people, including four children, died when strong winds from a rainstorm caused a metal roof on a school's activity center to collapse in Thailand. The U.S. Secret Service said that it had detained the driver of a rented box truck that crashed into security barriers near the White House, perhaps intentionally, but that there were no injuries or ongoing danger.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we finish off tonight's broadcast with Legoland Windsor Resort having created two new scenes depicting the event featuring Lego versions of the Monarch and Camilla Queen's Consort. Guests get to see the mini models on the balcony at Buckingham Palace wearing crowns and surrounded by hundreds of mini fans outside the gates. Stay safe and have a good night.